The Death Mask by Henrietta Dorothy Everett Read by Bethina Yes, that is a portrait of my wife. It is considered to be a good likeness, but of course she was older looking towards the last. Enderby and I were on our way to the smoking room after dinner and the picture hung on the staircase. We had been chums at school a quarter of a century ago and later on at college but I had spent the last decade out of England. I returned to find my friend a widower of four years standing. And a good job too, I thought to myself when I heard of it, for I had no great liking for the late Gloriana. Probably the sentiment or want of sentiment had been mutual. She did not smile on me, but I doubt if she smiled on any of poor Tom Enderby's bachelor cronies. The picture was certainly like her. She was a fine woman, with aquiline features and a cold eye. The artist had done the features justice, and the eye, which seemed to keep a steely watch on all the comings and goings of the house, out of which she had died. We only made a brief pause before the portrait and went on. The smoking room was an apartment built out at the back of the house by a former owner, and shut off by double doors to serve as a nursery. Mrs Enderby had no family and she disliked the smell of tobacco, so the big room was made over to Tom's pipes and cigars, and if Tom's friends wanted to smoke, they must smoke there, or not at all. I remembered the room and the rule, but I was not prepared to find it still existing. I had expected to light my after-dinner cigar over the dessert dishes. Now there was no presiding lady to consider. We were soon installed in a couple of deep cushioned chairs before a good fire. I thought Enderby breathed more freely when he closed the double doors behind us, shutting off the dull formal house and the staircase and the picture. But he was not looking well. There hung about him an unmistakable air of depression. Could he be fretting after Gloriana? Perhaps during their married years he had fallen into the way of depending on a woman to care for him. It is pleasant enough when the woman is the right sort, but I shouldn't myself have fancied being cared for by the late Mrs Enderby. And, if the fretting was a fact, it would be easy to find a remedy. Evelyn has a couple of pretty sisters and we would have him to stay at our place. You must run down and see us, I said presently, pursuing this idea. I want to introduce you to my wife. Can you come next week? His face lit up with real pleasure. I should like it of all things, he said heartily, but a qualification came after. The clouds settled back over him and he sighed. That is, if I can get away. Why, what is to hinder you? It may not seem much to stay for, but I, I have got in the way of stopping here to keep things together. He did not look at me, but leaned over to the fender to knock the ash off his cigar. Tell you what, Tom, you're getting hipped living by yourself. Why don't you sell the house or let it off just as it is and try a complete change? I can't sell it. I'm only the tenant for life. It was my wife's. Well, I suppose there is nothing to prevent you letting it, or if you can't let it, you might shut it up. There is nothing legal to prevent me. The emphasis was too fine to attract notice, but I remembered it after. Then, my dear fellow, why not? Knock about a bit and see the world, but to my thinking, the best thing you could do would be to marry again. He shook his head drearily. Of course, it is a delicate matter to urge upon a widower, but you have paid the utmost ceremonial respects. Four years, you know, the greatest stickler for propriety would deem it ample. It isn't that, Dick. I... I've a great mind to tell you a rather queer story. He puffed hard at his smoke and stared into the red coals in the pauses. But I don't know what you'd think of it, or think of me. Try me, I said. I'll give you my opinion after. And you know I'm safe to confide in. 
I sometimes think I should feel better if I told it. It's... it's queer enough to be laughable, but it hasn't been any laughing matter to me. He threw the stump of his cigar into the fire and turned to me, and then I saw how pale he was, and that a dew of perspiration was breaking out on his white face. I was very much of your opinion, Dick. I thought I should be happier if I married again, and I went so far as to get engaged, but the engagement was broken off, and I am going to tell you why. My wife was some time ailing before she died and the doctors were in consultation, but I did not know how serious her complaint was till the last. Then they told me there was no hope, as coma had set in. But it was possible, even probable, that there would be a revival of consciousness before death, and for this I was to hold myself ready. I dare say you will write me down a coward, but I dreaded the revival. I was ready to pray that she might pass away in her sleep. I knew she held exalted views about the marriage tie, and I felt sure if there were any last words she would exact a pledge. I could not at such a moment refuse to promise, and I did not want to be tied. You will recollect that she was my senior. I was about to be left a widower in middle life, and in the natural course of things I had a good many years before me, you see. My dear fellow, I don't think a promise so exhorted ought to bind you. It isn't fair. Wait and hear me. I was sitting here, miserable enough, as you may suppose, when the doctor came to fetch me to her room. Mrs Enderby was conscious and had asked for me, but he particularly begged me not to agitate her in any way, lest pain should return. She was lying stretched out in the bed, looking already like a corpse. Tom, she said, they tell me I am dying and there is something I want you to promise. I groaned in spirit. It was all up with me, I thought, but she went on. When I am dead, and in my coffin, I want you to cover my face with your own hands. Promise me this. It was not in the very least what I expected. Of course, I promised. I want you to cover my face with a particular handkerchief on which I set a value. When the time comes, open the cabinet to the right of the window, and you will find it in the third drawer from the top. You cannot mistake it, for it is the only thing in the drawer. That was every word she said, if you believe me, Dick. She just sighed and shut her eyes as if she were going to sleep, and she never spoke again. Three or four days later they came to ask me if I wished to take a last look, as the undertaker's men were about to close the coffin. I felt great reluctance, but it was necessary I should go. She looked as if made of wax, and was colder than ice to touch. I opened the cabinet, and there, just as she said, was a large handkerchief, a very fine cambric, lying by itself. It was embroidered with a monogram device in all four corners, and was not of a sort I had ever seen her use. I spread it out, and laid it over the dead face. And then what happened was rather curious. It seemed to draw down over the features and cling to them, to the nose and mouth and forehead and the shut eyes, till it became a perfect mask. My nerves were shaken, I suppose. I was seized with horror and flung back the covering sheet, hastily quitting the room, and the coffin was closed that night. Well, she was buried, and I put up a monument, which the neighbourhood considered handsome. As you see, I was bound by no pledge to abstain from marriage, and though I knew what would have been her wish, I saw no reason why I should regard it. And some months after, a family of the name of Ashcroft came to live at the Lisos, and they had a pretty daughter. I took a fancy to Lucy Ashcroft the first time I saw her, and it was soon apparent that she was well inclined to me. She was a gentle, yielding little thing, not the superior style of woman, not at all like... I made no comment, but I could well understand that in his new matrimonial venture, Tom would prefer a contrast. But I thought I had a very good chance of happiness with her, and I grew fond of her, very fond of her indeed. 
Her people were of the hospitable sort, and they encouraged me to go to Liso's, dropping in when I felt inclined. It did not seem as if they would be likely to put obstacles in our way. Matters progressed, and I made up my mind one evening to walk over there and declare myself. I had been up to town the day before and came back with a ring in my pocket, rather a fanciful design of double hearts, but I thought Lucy would think it pretty and would let me put it on her finger. I went up to change into dinner things, making myself as spruce as possible and coming to the conclusion before the glass that I was not such a bad figure of a man after all and that there was not much grey in my hair. I, Dick, you may smile. It is a good bit greyer now. I had taken out a clean handkerchief and thrown one carried through the day away, crumpled on the floor. I don't know what made me turn to look at it as it lay there, but once it caught my eye, I stood staring at it as if spellbound. The handkerchief was moving, Dick, I swear it, rapidly altering in shape, puffing up here and there as if blown by wind, spreading and moulding itself into the features of a face. And what face should it be but that death mask of Gloriana, which I had covered in the coffin eleven months before? To say I was horror-stricken conveys little of the feeling that possessed me. I snatched up the rag of cambric and flung it in the fire, and it was nothing but a rag in my hand, and in another moment no more than blackened tinder on the bar of the grate. There was no face below. Of course not, I said. It was a mere hallucination. You were cheated by an excited fancy. You may be sure I told myself all that and more, and I went downstairs and tried to pull myself together with a dram. But I was curiously upset, and for that night at least I found it impossible to play the wooer. The recollection of the death mask was too vivid. It would have come between me and Lucy's lips. The effect wore off, however. In a day or two I was bold again, and as much disposed to smile at my folly as you are at this moment. I proposed, and Lucy accepted me, and I put on the ring. Ashcroft Pear was graciously pleased to approve of the sentiments I offered, and Ashcroft Mayor pr promised to regard me as a son. And during the first forty-eight hours of our engagement, there was not a cloud to mar the blue. I proposed on a Monday, and on Wednesday I went again to dine and spend the evening with just their family party. Lucy and I found our way afterwards into the back drawing-room, which seemed to be made over to us by tacit understanding. Anyway, we had it to ourselves, and as Lucy sat on the settee, busy with her work, I was privileged to sit beside her, close enough to watch the careful stitches she was setting under which the pattern grew. She was embroidering a square of fine linen to serve as a tea cloth, and it was intended for a present to a friend. She was anxious, she told me, to finish it in the next few days, ready for dispatch. But I was somewhat impatient of her engrossment in the work. I wanted her to look at me while we talked, and to be permitted to hold her hand. I was making plans for a tour we would take together after Easter, arguing that eight weeks spent in preparation was enough for any reasonable bride. Lucy was easily entreated. She laid aside the linen square on the table at her elbow. I held her fingers captive, but her eyes wandered from my face, and she was deliciously shy. All at once, she exclaimed, her work was moving. There was growing to be a face in it. Did I not see? I saw indeed. It was the Gloriana death mask, forming there as it had formed in my handkerchief at home. The marked nose and chin, the severe mouth, the mould of forehead almost complete. I snatched it up and dropped it over the back of the couch. It did look like a face, I allowed, but never mind it, darling, I want you to attend to me. Something of this sort, I said, I hardly knew what, for my blood was running cold. Lucy pouted. She wanted to dwell on the marvel, and my impatient action had displeased her. I went on talking wildly, being afraid of pauses, but the psychological moment had gone by. I felt I did not carry her with me as before. She hesitated over my persuasions, the forecast of a Sicilian honeymoon had ceased to charm. By and by she suggested that Mrs Ashcroft would expect us to rejoin the circle in the other room 
and perhaps I would pick up her work for her, still with a slight air of offence. I walked round the settee to recover the luckless piece of linen, and she turned also, looking over the back, so at the same instant we both saw. There again was the face, rigid and severe, and now the corners of the cloth were tucked under, completing the form of the head. And that was not all. Some white drapery had been improvised and extended beyond it on the floor, presenting the complete figure laid out straight and stiff, ready for the grave. Lucy's alarm was excusable. She shrieked aloud, shriek upon shriek, and immediately an indignant family of Ashcrofts rushed in through the half-drawn portieres which divided the two rooms, demanding the cause of her distress. Meanwhile, I had fallen upon the puffed-out form and destroyed it. Lucy's embroidery composed the head. The figure was ingeniously contrived out of a large Turkish bath-sheet, brought in from one of the bedrooms, no one knew how or when. I held up the things, protesting their innocence, while the family were stabbing me through and through with looks of indignation, and Lucy was sobbing in her mother's arms. She might have been foolish, she allowed it. It did seem ridiculous now she saw what it was, but at the moment it was too dreadful. It looked so like, so like, and here a fresh sob choked her into silence. Peace was restored at last, but plainly the Ashcrofts doubted me. The genial father stiffened, and Mrs Ashcroft administered indirect reproofs. She hated practical joking, so she informed me she might be wrong, and no doubt she was old-fashioned, but she had been brought up to consider it in the highest degree ill-bred. And perhaps I had not considered how sensitive Lucy was, and how easily alarmed. She hoped I would take warning for the future, and that nothing of this kind would occur again. Practical joking, oh ye gods! as if it was likely that I, alone with the girl of my heart, would waste the precious hour in building up eff effigies of sham corpses on the floor. And Lucy ought to have known that the accusation was absurd, and I had never for a moment left her side. She did take my part when more composed, but the mystery remained beyond explanation of hers or mine. As for the future, I could not think of that without a failing heart. If the power arrayed against us were in truth what my superstition feared, I might as well give up hope at once, for I knew there would be no relenting. I could see the whole absurdity of the thing, as well as you do now. But, but if you put yourself in my place, Dick, you will be forced to confess that it was tragic too. I did not see Lucy the next day, as I was bound to go again to town but we had planned to meet and ride together on the Friday morning. I was to be at the Liso's at a certain hour, and you may be sure I was punctual. Her horse had already been brought round, and the groom was leading it up and down. I had hardly dismounted when she came down the steps of the porch, and I noticed at once a new look on her face, a harder set about that red mouth of hers which was so soft and kissable. But she let me put her up and on the saddle and settle her foot in the stirrup. And she was the bearer of a gracious message from her mother. I was expected to return to lunch, and Mrs Ashcroft begged us to be punctual, as a friend who had stayed the night with them would be leaving immediately after. "'You will be pleased to meet her, I think,' said Lucy, leaning forward to pat her horse. "'I find she knows you well. It's Miss Kingsworthy.' Now, Miss Kingsworthy was a school friend of Gloriana's, who used now and then to visit us here. I was not aware that she and the Ashcrofts were acquainted, but, as I have said, they had only recently come into the neighbourhood as tenants of the Lisos. I had no opportunity to express pleasure or the reverse, for Lucy was riding on and putting her horse to a brisk pace. It was some time before she drew rein, and again admitted conversation. We were descending a steep hill, and the groom was following at a discreet distance behind, far enough to be out of earshot. Lucy looked very pretty on horseback, but this is by the way. The mannish hat suited her, and so did the habit fitting closely to her shape. 
Tom, she said, and again I noticed that new hardness in her face. Tom, Miss Kingsworthy tells me your wife did not wish you to marry again, and she made you promise that you would not. Miss Kingsworthy was quite astonished to hear that you and I were engaged. Is this true? I was able to tell her it was not, that my wife had never asked and I had never given her any such pledge. I allowed she disliked sick marriages in certain cases, and perhaps she had made some remark to that effect to Miss Kingsworthy. It was not unlikely. And then I appealed to her. Surely she would not let a mischief maker's tittle-tattle come between her and me. I thought her profile looked less obdurate, but she would not let her eyes meet mine as she answered, Of course not, if that was all and I doubt it w I would have heeded it, only that it seemed to fit in with something else. Tom, it was very horrible what we saw on Wednesday evening, and, and don't be angry, but I asked Miss Kensworthy what your wife was like. I did not tell her why I wanted to know. What has that to do with it? I demanded stoutly enough, but alas, I was too well aware. She told me Mrs Enderby was handsome, but she had very marked features, and was severe-looking when she did not smile, a high forehead, a Roman nose, and a decided chin. Tom, the face in the cloth was just like that. Did you not see? Of course, I protested. My darling, what nonsense! I saw it looked a little like a face, but I pulled it to pieces at once because you were frightened. Why, Lucy, I shall have you turning into a spiritualist if you take up these fancies. No, she said, I do not want to be anything foolish. I have thought it over, and if it only happens once, I have made up my mind to believe it a mistake and to forget it. But if it comes again, if it goes on coming, here she shuddered and turned white. Oh, Tom, I could not, I could not. That was the ultimatum. She liked me as much as ever, she even owned to a warmer feeling, but she was not going to marry a haunted man. Well, I suppose I cannot blame her. I might have given the same advice in another fellow's case, though in my own I felt it hard. I am close to the end now, so I shall need to tax your patience very little longer. A single chance remained. Gloriana's power, whatever its nature and however derived, might have been so spent in the previous efforts that she could effect no more. I clung to this shred of hope and did my best to play the part of the light-hearted lover, the sort of companion Lucy expected, who would shape himself to her mood. But I was conscious that I played it ill. The ride was a lengthy business. Lucy's horse cast a shoe, and it was impossible to change the saddle onto the groom's hack or my own mare, as neither of them had been trained to the habit. We were bound to return at a foot pace, and did not reach the Lisos until two o'clock lunch was over. Mrs Ashcroft had set out for the station driving Miss Kingsworthy, but some cutlets were keeping hot for us, so we were informed and could be served immediately. We went at once into the dining room as Lucy was hungry, and she took off her hat and laid it on a side table. She said the close fit of it made her head ache. The cutlets had been misrepresented. They were lukewarm, but Lucy made a good meal off them, and the fruit tart which followed, very much at her leisure. Heaven knows I would not have grudged her so much as a mouthful, but that luncheon was an ordeal I cannot readily forget. The servant absented himself, having seen us served, and then my troubles began. The tablecloth seemed alive at the corner which was between us. It rose in waves as if puffed up by a wind, though the window was fast shut against any wandering airs. I tried to seem unconscious, tried to talk as if no horror of apprehension was filling all my mind, while I was flattening out the bewitched damask with a grasp I hardly dared relax. Lucy rose at last, saying she must change her dress. Occupied with the cloth, it had not occurred to me to look round or to keep watch on what might be going on in another part of the room. The hat on the side table had been tilted over sidewards, and in that position it was made to crown another presentation of the face. 
What it was made of this time I cannot say, probably a serviette, as several lay about. The linen material of whatever sort was again moulded into the perfect form, but this time the mouth showed humour and appeared to relax in a grim smile. Lucy shrieked and dropped into my arms in a swoon, a real genuine fainting fit out of which she was brought round with difficulty after summoning help of doctors. I hung about miserably till her safety was assured and then went as miserably home. Next morning I received a cutting little note from my mother-in-law-elect, in which she returned the ring and informed me that the engagement must be considered at an end. Well, Dick, you know now why I did not marry. And what have you to say? <laughs> was The Death Mask by Henrietta Dorothy Everett. She was born in 1851 and died in 1923. She also wrote under a nom de plume, Theo Douglas. She's forgotten now but was very popular during her lifetime and wrote many books and short stories, often ghost and fantasy stories. I hope you enjoyed this one. If you did, please remember to click the like button and consider subscribing to my channel for more spooky stories. And as always, thank you for listening.